Hello and welcome back to my channel. And today you find me in relaxed, lazy mode. It's just after Easter. I hope you've had a fabulous Easter. I had a birthday a few uh, weeks ago. Look at this. Look at this amazing present from my brother and my sister combined. Yes, it's the Pasolini 101 set from Criterion. Unbelievable. What a great present that is. It's so beautiful, isn't it? My precious. Mm. I'm, uh, I was going to do a Pasolini top 10 actually, uh, but now I've got this, I want to go through them all, watching them on lovely Criterion Blu-ray, so that will be coming later in the year. I also, I sort of indulged myself, I got the new Blu-ray of Devil Girl from Mars. I don't know if you've heard of this movie. It was uh, Britain's rather cheap and tatty contribution to the 1950s sci-fi cycle. It's hilarious. You know, it's clearly they had this script in the in the bottom of their drawer, you know, about this escaped convict who he flees to this pub where his girlfriend is serving behind the bar. And that was obviously the original story. And they tacked on this story about this flying saucer that comes down from the skies. And out of it comes this dominatrix woman in black leather gear who says, we need men on Mars. Why did that never happen to me when I was a teenager? I used to dream about that kind of thing. But in this movie, it actually happens. And for some reason, the men don't want to go. It's bizarre. I mean, mind you, Hazel Court is in the pub. It's great fun. It's a desperate attempt to cash in on the sort of US sci-fi cycle. And um, it's, it's a lot of fun. And there is a crappy robot in it because they've just seen The Day the Earth Stood Still by Robert Wise. They think they've got to have a robot in it when they clearly can't afford it. Though actually the, um, the flying saucer effects are quite good fun. So I bought that for myself. I also indulged and I got the 4K of my two favourite John Carpenter films, The Fog and the Thing. Oh, he loves 4K, I do. Oh, he loves it. But I'm still sort of... I only got my 4K player at Christmas, so I'm still sort of treading out in the shallows a bit. Also, I've been reading this. I don't know if any of you have got this. Damnable Tales, a folk horror anthology. It's superb really good collection of folk horror stories uh, from classic writers um, all illustrated um, very well throughout very atmospheric illustrations um, I've, I've really been enjoying it um, wonderful story by Robert Louis Stevenson Thrawn Janet and I've just read The Withered Arm by Thomas Hardy if you've never read that it is a great piece of writing it's really really good really good twist at the end as well so that's my birthday indulgences. But I thought today what I'd do, just for a laugh, I thought I'd tell you, you know, we're a quarter of the way through the year, so I thought I'd share with you my favourite 10 discoveries, old and new, in cinema so far this year. I'm going to kick off with, I know I've mentioned this website so many times, but I'm not going to stop plugging it because it's so amazing. The Cave of Forgotten Films, Rare Films with 2Ms.com. It's brilliant. What someone has done is, is trawled YouTube around the globe and found whole movies that you could watch and, um, and put English subtitles to them. And through that, I discovered a film I've been looking for for years. It's called La Casa del Ankel. And it was made by Leopoldo Torre Nilsson. Now, back in the late 50s and 60s and early 70s, this Argentinian director was one of the major directors working. Now, no one watches his films. Then I don't. There's no Blu-rays. There's no DVDs. They're not streamed. They've kind of vanished. Well, on this site, on this YouTube site, you can find this movie. It's really interesting. It was made in the late fifties. It's one of Jonathan Rosenbaum's essential films, and uh, it's kind of like Bunuel. It's about this this young girl. She's coming of age, you know, getting into sexual awareness, and she's uh, she's the daughter of a of a wealthy. He's a kind of businessman stroke parliamentarian in Argentina. And he has this close friend who is trying to be the new, young, invigorating person in Argentine politics. And we know that these two people, this girl and this politician, are gonna to collide together in a probably inadvisable liaison of some kind. So it's kind of Bunwellian, because you go from this girl discovering about sex, and there's all this, all this sort of very Catholic repression of sex, but also lots of stories about people getting off with each other. You know, Bunwell's, you know, that sort of giggling, sort of naughtiness of Bunwell, combined with this quite intelligent um, examination of Argentine politics, where you go into the Argentine political chamber. And this 
this coming into coming out of innocence into knowledge and this sinking into degradation are, are sort of mirrored but it's a very good film if you get a chance to see it the second film um, thanks to second run uh, DVD in the UK was The Devil's Trap The Devil's Trap is uh, an early film by František Vlachil he's this Czech director who's really admired in the Czech Republic in fact his film Marketa Lazarova is regarded as the greatest Czech film ever made and that is really something because that country has produced so many great movies. František Vlachil is a brilliant director and I cannot understand why he's not more admired and The Devil's Trap, this isn't even one of his greatest films but it just shows what a great director he is, a great instinctive director, a director who's got an instinctive feel for sight and sound. I mean the opening of this film which sees a, a mill burned is absolutely incredible just visually stunning and it's a wonderful shot where the, the camera seems to fly across the land at top speed towards the upper story of the mill it's a shot that's repeated throughout the film it's quite brilliant it's a kind of story where an independent mill owner outside the local community the local uh, bigwigs want to have him sort of branded as a witch so that they can undermine his new political sort of proto-communist ideals. So it's that kind of movie, but God, it's great. And I cannot understand why Vlachil is not more admired. Number three, The Friends. Now, <clears throat> I only got to know a Japanese director called Shinji Somai very recently. He's a real cult figure in Japan, but he's not very well known in the West, and he really should be, and in a way, He's my ideal kind of director because what he does is he takes ordinary everyday stories and he treats them with a rawness, right? So that they're sort of, you know, in, in terms of their continuity editing, they're linear, but there's a rawness, a spikiness in the filmmaking that reminds me a bit of Jean Vigo. But what he also does is he, he interjects little bits of surrealism that throw you off kilter. Is, are we meant to take this film seriously? Is it on the level or is something else going on? To me, it's the perfect kind of filmmaking. The Friends is not his best film, but it's really worth watching. It's a children's film. And it's like those kind of children's film foundation movies you used to get in the UK all those years ago. It's about these three kids, these three boisterous lads who play football together. And one day they come across this old house in, near their local housing estate. And there's this old bloke there who no one ever talks to. And they become obsessed with him and they start spying on him. And then what happens is, they slowly get to know him. And rather improbably, the old man says, come and do my garden for me, and come and tart up my house for me. And it becomes their life. And they help this old man and befriend him. And they find out that he's this war veteran who's got this terrible past. See, this is what I like about Shinji Shomai. He takes this rather sweet kind of Spielbergian fable of old and young, but he throws in bits of darkness like the horror of what this man went through in the last days of the Second World War in the Japanese army. And then at the end, he throws you another curveball to show you the darkness behind the story you've just been watching, or maybe to undercut it entirely and to point up how improbable it all is that these boys would enjoy helping this old man. And that's what I like about Soma and why I think this film is really valuable. So give it a try if you can find it. It's called The Friends. Fourth place, again going back to rarefilms.com, my new favourite resource, Tale of Genji. Uh, now this is a famous story in Japanese literature. It was a 10th century novel written by a lady-in-waiting in the Japanese imperial court. Actually, the original um, manuscript is missing. It's been sort of reconstructed over the years. Um, the story has kept going. <clears throat> And it's a story about this young man who comes into the court and women just fall at his feet. It's a bit improbable actually because when you watch this movie you think why on earth do they fancy him because he's a complete prat. But anyway, enough about that. Um, and it's about his, the way he ruins all these women's life as he, as he goes through this court. Um, the film that I'm talking about was made in the early 1950s by Yoshimura who's not a very well-known director in the West, again, an excellent director. If you're interested in his work, they're doing a season of his films at Il Cinema Ritrovato in Bologna in Italy this summer. 
Um, he's not very well known in the West because he kept changing his style. And this film is very much like Mizuguchi. It's very pretty and stately. And it obviously is aping the sort of world of, I think it's Kabuki theatre, the puppet theatre in Japan. Uh, Alexander Jacobi, who's done a dictionary of Japanese filmmakers, um, rather glibly dismisses this film as just pretty, surface prettiness he calls it. I think that's a bit harsh. It is a film that's all about, you know, the beauty of the, the shots and it is an extraordinarily beautiful film. And it's very stately and slow, so it might not be to everyone's taste, but I think Jacoby is undermining how much the film is trying to ape a certain kind of theatricality. And it, and it often has very sort of deliberately artificial shots which are quite beautiful. So one girl that he meets, he meets her at night under the new spring moon and she's captured under its light like a goddess above him on a slope. It's like a beautiful painting. So even on YouTube, even on YouTube uh, you know, quality, it is a beautiful film and well worth tracking down. The fifth film, I just bought it on Blu-ray. <clears throat> Now, this is a bit of a rediscovery, because I have actually seen this film before, but I was up at my mum's watching it on Talking Pictures with her, and I felt like I'd seen it for the first time. I didn't really give this film a proper chance when I first watched it. I just thought it was a, a rather dull uh, whodunit. But it's a lot more than that. It was made by Frank Launder and Sidney Gilliatt, a kind of poor man's pal and Pressburger. But during the war years, they made some really good propaganda films. Millions Like Us, Waterloo Road with John Mills. And then just after the war, after the war had finished, they made this movie, Green for Danger. And this belongs to a weird kind of subgenre of British film. Um, sort of healing propaganda. So the war is finished and we're coming to terms with where we are and what we've done. It's a weird kind of thing that happens in British cinema for a few years after the war. And what Launder and Gilead do is, they present this as a whodunit, right? And it's got all the classic ingredients of an Agatha Christie whodunit, right? So it sets up at the beginning, it pretty much tells you who your suspects are. They're the doctors and nurses in an operating theatre, in a small makeshift hospital that has been set up in this, you know, this Elizabethan stately home, which gives a tremendous atmosphere all the way through the film. And you, you, you know that this old post office guy is going to be killed during the course of the operation and you, then you know Alistair Sim comes in a wonderful performance as this odd slightly aggressive slightly sarcastic um, rather silly kind of inspector from Scotland Yard to sort it out and you'll get to find out who the murderer is but that's not really what's enjoyable about the film what's enjoyable about the film is its evocation of life in wartime Britain and this evocation of these people working at this hospital under terrible conditions, it's filmed in an almost noirish light, but with a weird sense of humour. It's almost, there's also kind of horror film uh, sort of stylings in it when the person gets killed. So it's a very odd movie. It's got a very odd tone to it. And what becomes apparent is that what the film is really about, it's not about working out who the murderer is. It's understanding that the motives of the people the doctors and the nurses, are the motives of all of us who had to live through the war. And they're all sympathetic, and they become more sympathetic than Alistair Sim's inspector. So it's a healing propaganda, where the establishment in the figure of this policeman is not our identity figure, identification figure, it's the suspects and what they're going through. And I think that's what makes this film really, really interesting. So do check it out if you've never seen it. It's an unusual British movie. What else have we got here? Number six, Monster. Coriada is back. Um, this is a lovely film. It's a bit too long. It's a bit baggy. I think, you know, it's, it's a story. It's like a bit like Rashomon, where you see a story told from different points of view, and it's told from three different points of view. The first point of view is a, a mother, and she discovers that her son is having trouble at school and that a particular teacher seems to be you know harassing him and persecuting him so the first part of the film is her journey of fighting the school to get reparations then you switch to the point of view of the teacher who's a young male teacher 
who's trying to do his best and comes into a difficult situation and then you switch to the point of view of the boy and his friend and you find out what it's really about the thing is in all honesty I'll be I will tell the truth here I think the first two parts for me are more interesting than the third part which is more of a love story I'm a cranky old git you know I like the dark side you know but the love story is beautifully handled unfortunately when I went to go and see it at the cinema I had to you know I'm getting old I can't sit through these long movies anymore without having to go to the toilet so I missed a bit the bit when the two boys were getting to know each other I've kind of given away a bit of the plot there but it doesn't really matter you know I had to leave I had to leave, but anyway, um, but I saw most of the movie and it's a very good film. Corriere's typically beautiful movie making, great fun. Um, the acting, I mean, the, the lead actress is just the great actress of our times. I'm sorry I've forgotten her name, I'll put it up on um, the screen while I'm speaking, because she is just sublime. She's been in a lot of her movies, she was in Shoplifters, and she is just absolutely fantastic. But Monster is well worth watching. I'd, go, I'd watch it at home rather than go to see it at the cinema. In seventh, now I'm, I'm grateful to a subscriber here. I, I can't find who it was who recommended this to me, but someone, when I did my British Noir video, recommended to me Payroll. Payroll is a heist thriller, not usually my kind of movie if I'm honest. It was made in 1961 in Britain and it was made in Newcastle. I always liked films set in the north of England. And it's a classic heist thriller. Some guys work out how to rob a bank, uh, which has got some newfangled security, and they work away past it. And then, of course, they all fall out and everything goes wrong. So it's, you know, pure cliche, right? So if you're expecting something original, forget it. But what I liked about Payroll was it's just a very well made genre film. Great acting, fantastic cast, Billy Whitelaw's in it. Um, I mean, I, I forget the other actors now, but it's, it's a wonderful cast of old British character actors. And they're all given really good parts. They're, there's a very complex plot and a very complex sort of set of relationships. And that it's really well explored. And it's shot brilliantly. Um, and I, thought, I found it thoroughly entertaining. Um, one of the things I liked about the movie, that was my stomach there. I'm not gonna edit, usually I'd edit that out if I have a bad moment with my stomach. But I'm feeling lazy today. It's post Easter blues, so you just have to put up with it. So um, I was I was watching it, and one of the things I like about it is, halfway through, the plot devolves to the women involved in the storyline. So there's a there's a, a security guard who's killed, and there's also a sort of woman who's becoming involved with the head of the gangsters, and they become the main protagonists, and the, the sort of revenge between them becomes the, the the thing that drives the plot. And I really liked that partly because one of the actresses is Billy Whitewell and she's bloody amazing. So it's a good film, check it out. My stomach's doing cartwheels now. Anyway, uh, number eight. Um, this is come out on DVD in Britain. And I am so pleased, finally, Kiju Yoshita, one of the great Japanese directors, is finally getting the recognition he deserves in the UK and in the West. Kiju Yoshita, was one of those directors like Oshima, you know, who came of age in the sort of Japanese new wave. And he, he made some early youth films, as they're called in Japan. And then he made a film called Akitsu Springs. I keep praising this movie because it stunned me when I saw it at the cinema. I knew nothing about it. It's almost like a sort of Japanese Wuthering Heights. And it's done in this beautiful technicolor. And it ramps up the melodrama almost to a sort of artificial pitch. So it's sort of, it's more melodramatic than melodrama. Then he's, he made, in that film, he met Mariko Okada, who apparently is still alive. Mariko Okada, who, was, who became his wife. And they made six films together throughout the 60s in Japan, which are, they're often called in criticism anti-melodrama. They're all melodramatic subjects, but treated in a very sort of serious, quite heavy, uh, almost Antonioni-like art house way. He is, he's often seen as the Japanese equivalent of Antonioni, though I think he's a very different filmmaker with different preoccupations. But he's, he's as close as Japanese cinema gets to European art house cinema. And I think those films are absolutely stunning. This is the first of them, a story written with water. And I watched this for the first time this year. And it's an extraordinary film. It must have been incredible to watch this in Japan. Because it's about this young 
executive guy. He's about to get married to this uh, girl who's related to one of his bosses. But all the way through the film, there's this implication that he might be in love with his mother, who's very, very young. He's played by an actress who's deliberately almost his age. Yoshida sort of gets away with this. And she is involved in this long-term affair with one of his bosses. So that's the kind of rather sort of torrid uh, framework of the film. Honestly, it is an absolute masterpiece of a film. It really, it sort of digs down. It's a very adult, very intelligent film of, of an intensity that you just don't find in cinema anymore. Highly recommend it. I also caught up with Affair in the Snow, which is another film of this series. I don't think quite as good, but visually stunning. A kind of love triangle, uh, very sort of artificially, it's not meant to be taken totally literally, of two men both in love with the same woman. It's all set in this kind of up in the mountains in this snowy resort, and they're sort of traipsing through the snow and their sort of battles through this climate are representative of what's happening in their love life. It's a bit, you know, metaphorical, but it, it just about works. Uh, ninth film I'm going to talk about is Tuki Buki. What a great title, which is on this wonderful uh, box set, World Cinema Project, Volume 1. It's um, Martin Scorsese's World Film Foundation. They, they've, you know, uh, restored many films from world cinema over the years. I bought this in Italy, so I don't know if this is the one that you can get in the UK and the States and elsewhere. Um, it's a bilingual box set, but you can get versions of this in whatever territory you're in. This box set is amazing. On the same box set, you've got Memories of Underdevelopment. It's called, I'll say that again, Memories of Underdevelopment. What a title that is, by Thomas Gutierrez Alea, my favorite Cuban film, it's a really good film. Weird title, but it's a very good film. Uh, it's about this sort of intellectual who's caught up in the Cuban Revolution. And at first he doesn't believe in it, he thinks it's barbaric, and then he comes to terms with it. It's a very good film. Manila in the Claws of Neon, Lino Broca, which is a brilliant Filipino film. Chess of the Wind uh, by Mohamed Reza Aslani. Not so interesting, but if, you, if you've ever watched a lot of Iranian films, Iranian cinema, it's well worth checking out because it's very different, it's very unusual, very claustrophobic, it's all set in this one house. Tuki Buki and Taipei Story by Edward Yang, which is a masterpiece. But Tuki Buki, I only got round to this year. It's uh, an African film, it's from Senegal, and it's by a director called Jibril Diop Mambete. And it's, it's what you might call a youth film, sort of radical youth film. This boy and this girl who want to get, they want to get out um, of their society and go to Europe and make something of themselves as they see it. But as it goes on, the, the boy in the, in the story becomes more and more disillusioned and, and starts to question what they want. Uh, that makes it sound all very serious. It's a very sensual film. It's a film that's all about sound and image. It's a wonderfully sensual film that the colours and that the locations and the sense of life and, you know, robustness and rawness in the filmmaking is really great. One little word of warning for those of you who are going to see it. If you are squeamish about um, cruelty to animals, this is a tough film to watch. One of the main metaphors that Jibril Diop Mambetta uses throughout it is the slaughtering of oxen, which is a sort of metaphor analogy for what's happening to his people. And my God, you see it in raw reality, you know, loads of blood. It's really horrible. So that's a little warning. But um, a very, an, an extraordinary film. Um, I'd even go so far as to say probably my favourite African film that I've watched so far. It's a really good film. And finally, in 10th place, is Zone of Interest. Jonathan Glazer. But I'm not going to say a single word about that in this video because I intend to do a video devoted to that film very soon and it will be a very controversial video. So watch out for that. So there we go, there's 10 films to be going on with. Uh, I've got you, I'll tell you what else I'm going to recommend to you while I'm here. At the moment, uh, look, I've got two pairs of glasses, it's like the two Ronnies, you know, goodbye from him and it's good night from him. Um, I'm watching that at the moment, The Human Condition, nine hour Japanese film. Apparently it's shown once a year in Japan in marathon screenings. I've never seen it before. Kobayashi, who made Kwaidan. I'm also watching this, The Ascent of Man. Um, you may, maybe have heard of Civilization with Kenneth Clark, 
who was an art historian in England and he presented this series about the history of Western art. And a few years later, they got Jacob Bronowski, a scientist, to do a history of science and the history of development of human thinking. It is absolutely brilliant. I can't understand why it hasn't been released on Blu-ray. It's so good. This is television documentary at its very best. I'm really enjoying it. So there we go. I'm sorry I haven't been doing many videos lately. I've been a bit, uh, a bit lazy. So I've got, I've got lots of issues. You now I've got this, I've got a smell downstairs in my hallway. I think some, some critter has died under the floorboards. So I, I tried to, you know, I've tried to get these little odor things, you know, like, like little air fresheners. I put those up. It's made it worse. It's gone from smelling like poo to smelling like a gent's lav. So if anyone out there knows about smells, let me know. Anyway, I'll hope, I'm hoping to do more videos later on. I'll get back to it. But that Zone of Interest video is coming.